disconnected frequency or non electrocuting lining. Because we don't have power civilization like some other things short answers yet to do. We'll take a national commitment to make, uh, make those changes, it will take uh, perception, people can see, connecting the dots. But uh, electricity in the country, the average cost per kilowatt hour in the United States is about eight to eight and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, this system can amortize the cost over 40 years, which would be easily within the lifetime of the photovoltaic array on the building. Uh, it comes out about 13 cents. Now, this is where whole cost accounting becomes important. How do we keep the books? And everybody knows that a kilowatt hour electricity is worth a good bit more, costs a good bit more than eight and a half cents. By the time you add in uh, military costs of protecting our lines of supply, uh, cost of acid rain, acid mine damage, uh, those who die from small particle inflation from burning coal, it's about 50,000 people per year according to the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, climatic change, the cost could range up to what, 40 or 45 cents per kilowatt hour. So the issue here is can we begin to develop a different kind of power distributed production? Now the short answer is the technology here all exists. NASA has been doing this in space shuttle missions for a long time. It sounds kind of familiar. To, uh, what's taking place in computing? Uh, then we have uh, mainframe computers. Uh, we've got notebook computers and small computing devices because the cost of uh, computing dropped dramatically and performance rose dramatically. The same thing is about to happen uh, in power production for oil tank arrays, uh, fuel cells, wind, wind generators, light turbines, and so forth. We begin to change dramatically the kind of power system we've got. So we've got distributed computing. Eventually, in the not too distant future, I think we should have distributed power production. This is all part of the hardware for you. This is what it will look like in part. We're taking sunlight and converting sunlight to electricity with photovoltaics, and then doing electrolysis of water one of the ways to store electricity in the nighttime or cloudy weather, simply to convert the electrons into hydrogen. When you're running, uh, remember that experiment in high school chemistry or college where you run electricity through a battery with a slightly salty water and you split the H from the O2 very well. When you get the, uh, you store the hydrogen and you run the hydrogen back through a fuel cell at nighttime or cloudy weather. The fuel cell recombines hydrogen with oxygen. Uh, there's nothing new about this. Uh, the science behind this has been known or suspected since 1939. Uh, NASA powered space shuttle missions in this way, but this is distributed power. We can develop electrons here with wind power and a variety of other kinds of things, but this is the beginning of the hydrogen economy. Now, think about this sort of transition. What do we have to offer the world? Well, we've got a lot of science, we've got a lot of technology, we have a lot of know-how. And so can we design a world that operates on sunlight, current sunlight, on ancient sunlight stored as fossil fuels? The short answer again is yes. This is not a matter of technology, it's a matter of politics. There's nothing necessarily inevitable about that. Now, cost assessment, just a couple of notes here on the cost of this particular building. The costs are sometimes hard to calculate. The way we typically do this is to look at the front end cost. But then we all know that buildings impose, and cars and everything else impose, costs over their expected lifetime. So a low front end cost for a building or a house or car or whatever, but a high operating cost is no kind of bargain. Not when you're doing real cost economics. And then there are environmental costs, which we typically externalize. And then there's something we want to subtract from the cost calculations that is simply collateral benefits of doing things the right way or avoiding major errors. In terms of our project, uh, the Adam Joseph Lewis Center, the cost breakdown a little bit like this. It's total cost is about 7.1 million. That's not construction. That's the total project cost, which includes all of these things. So design and research on the building is a fairly expensive item because we engage students in that process. We asked McDonough and partners and the 18 members of the design team that were beyond the McDonough firm, people from NASA, people from Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, John Todd, Carol Frank, and John Lyle, a whole group of people around the country. We asked them to do a good bit of research on green design and alternative uh, design techniques. Uh, construction anomalies. Uh, some of the things that were site specific that were not uh, normal for the building cost us about 1.2 million. The endowment for the building was a half a million dollars. The construction cost uh, was 4 million plus. Uh, so you come out with a, a building cost that is uh, for our kind of building, built in our bid environment, at that size and scale is roughly within the, the normal range. Now, uh, here's another thing I think we have along the world. And this has to do with a genuine conservatism. The point here is very simple. 
that this old division between the right and the left really does important. It doesn't much describe anything very important. But we have that on, on good authority. Uh, Edmund Burke, the uh, father of modern conservatism, said in a wonderful uh, uh, book called Reflection on the Revolution of France, that we in the current generation simply trustees midway between the distant past and the distant future. And our job as trustees is to pass on, as he put it, an entailed inheritance. And by what he meant by that, an inheritance that includes the social institutions and culture and laws and so forth of civil society. Our job was to pass on that inheritance. Thomas Jefferson, in a wonderful letter to James Madison in 1789, a year before Burke's uh, reflection on the Revolution of France, said much of the same thing. A famous letter where he describes that no generation has the right to pass debt off to the next generation coming behind it or after it. Now change one thing with Burke. Change the idea that debt, uh, that, that entailed inheritance includes more than just civil society, includes all the ecological records on which civil society rests, clean air, clean water, soil, wildlife. And that's a change that Burke would have agreed to. Change one thing with Jefferson, and that is that debt can be both economic and ecological. You didn't see a convergence between left and right that suggests that the real political divisions aren't between left and right, they're between present and future. It's us and our children. So, how do we think about this? What is the contribution we have to healing political divisions in the country at this point? It is not to try to create a dialogue assuming that left and right is the proper uh, geometry of this, uh, this experience. It is thinking about this in the long term future sense. This is what I think we have to offer. And that is the whole idea that no generation, no organization, college, university, corporation, whatever, has the right to change the biogeochemical cycle of the earth or to impair the stability and integrity and beauty of biotic systems. The consequences of which will fall as a kind of remote tyranny on future generations. That's what we have to offer. It is a very different kind of way to think about politics. It is not right and left. It's not liberal versus conservative, present versus future. We have a couple of other things I think to offer. For those of you specifically as students, there can be in this movement a lot of bad news. Turn that coin over and there's a lot of good news. The environment, if you begin to think about environment as a, a, a career, and that's the word environment in virtually any other career track you're thinking of. Environmental health is a terrific field. Green design or environmental design is a great field. Community design is a fantastic area. Sustainable agriculture, sustainable forestry. There's never been a time in history when there was more opportunity to do uh, better things, more meaningful things, and what Thomas Berry calls the great work of our time. This is a time of tremendous danger, yes, but tremendous opportunity as well. And if we are to begin to connect the dots, we need lots of young people from fields like this and many others. So part of our job as uh, educators is to equip you as best we're able to take advantage of the opportunities of our time. Now, one final thing I think we have to offer, and that's uh, very simply this. D.H. Lawrence put it this way. We don't know, we know the characteristics of uh, A and O. Uh, we have nothing, no knowledge of what uh, uh, would occur if you combine those two. It's that third thing. And it is that central mystery. We'll never solve it. The mystery is going to recede in front of us uh, like darkness in front of the headlights in the car. But one of the things we have to offer will is a sense, a sense of the larger mystery of life and the sense that this mystery is part of a gift that we are obliged to pass on, whether it entailed inheritance or form simply debt-free uh, life. We are obliged to pass that on to the future. Now, one final note. What our job here is in education, it seems to me, is to equip young people for a very different kind of world. 9-11, the events of 9-11 changed that dramatically. And I want to underscore one last time. If we don't speak out, if we don't inventory what it is that we have to offer the world, we will be reduced a very small footnote. We'll miss an opportunity, a teachable moment, I think, in our culture and our own national history. So this is a time of uh, danger, yeah, a time of opportunity for sure. It's time for us to be counted as environmental people wanting to build sustainable communities. And that job is fundamentally, I think, one that begins or ought to begin in educational institutions. This is a challenge to the way we think, first and foremost. It's not so much a challenge to our technology or even our economics or even to our politics first. It is an educational challenge. So I thank you for your time and attention. And uh, I'm, uh, if you have some questions, thank you very much for the applause. I know why.
We do have time for questions now, and Jane has a microphone. Maybe what you could do is come forward to in either row. I don't think that mic is on. There's two on, it's just holding on. What can the university do to be a better resource for the students here? What can we do to be a better resource? Yeah, what can we do? For there to come to my next for right in town, I believe it's about the balance of their leaving you with instructions on what to do. I got a couple of team instructions for the audience. Look, I think that this is a good way to jump in my whole squad of our experience at the moment. But there are 3,860 RFPs around the country. Uh, my power of management is almost $200 million a year. Investment power is called market drop, which is uh, roughly comparable. And so these, these are big numbers. We have a lot of power. 14 million students, uh, 1.5 to 1.8 million faculty uh, involved in higher education research. We've got a lot of power. This is a lot of power. And if we look for uh, government's lead, it is going to be. It has not been. If we look for corporations lead, and here's where I'm going to part company a little bit with uh, Avery and, and Bill, a uh, few corporations have that, but they are notable by the fact that there are a few corporations. There is Interface, which gives a lot of publicity. There's uh, some interesting things going on in DuPont and a few other places. But uh, I think if we expect corporations to lead, I think we're, we're, we're going to be disappointed. Who else will do this? And this is where education comes in. We have an obligation to uh, the students that uh, uh, sit in our classes to help to train them and uh, make a better world. And that means looking at university out of college operations, our buying power, what we do is uh, educate what happens in classrooms. The revolution needs to begin here. And that's, uh, I think it's beginning to happen. It's slower than, than I think it should happen, but a couple of very specific things. Uh, at Oakland College, you've uh, set up a committee to look at uh, everything from uh, energy, water, materials, landscaping, building design, making everything across the board. We don't operate the policies for them. So it's not just the Calwon Declaration, it's a very nice word, it's a very interesting document, but it's operational guidelines for how the university exerts its presence in the world. The second thing is, uh, you know, none of those who graduated from four years of college and four years of public education as a technological field literate. And we assume that they need to know about the rules of the market economy and all that, but not the rules of how the planet works. And that's simply a mistake. That's a huge mistake. So having a technological literate student body and faculty is, is terribly important. Now, to get there, I think there, there's, uh, there's serious changes. We think of rigor as being uh, something that goes deeper and deeper into uh, a particular field of study. You know, we're about uh, knowing more and more about less and less until you know everything about nothing. Now, it's not arguing against rigor, but it's saying rigor has two different forms. One is that postal kind of rigor, that's fine, we need them. The other is kind of a lateral, lateral rigor, how to connect the fields, systems things, in other words. And so we need the election to walk on both legs, and students need to come out of the college experience and quick to do that. That means also faculty need the permission of tenure time and salary promotion time also to have uh, work laterally if they so choose during the course of a career. So there are some significant changes, I think, often in the way the uh, uh, college and university operates. That, that's a short answer to a very good question. Thanks for asking, but it's a long, no short description of that. Let's try that. Back to back. Um, recently, um, I almost had an opportunity um, 
to teach the class on environmental issues and graphic design at RISD and was told they didn't have the budget this semester for it. So I started talking to the head of the department and I started saying, you know, this is something that you don't say I don't have a budget for, this is something that you say there's just no question about it. It's something that the students learn because before you even talk about a science project, you should be talking about the earth theme as well. Um, can you, and I'm gonna start in, in the spring, you told me to call him, so I'm gonna start putting the V in his bonnet, but do you have any suggestions as to how to convince a department that is so entrenched in concept? I mean, I went to RISD because they were actual, they were great thinkers. Um, and they have, they're great concept generators, but they, there's a, they, they I don't know if they truly understand the, the need for this very pragmatic, you know, not lofty class, but very pragmatic earthy class. Do you have any suggestions of how to get something like this integrated? Three, 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 part of German? No. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to put back up. I'm just trying to buy some time to think. I didn't talk to German. Sure, first. Um, no, I, I think there, there's a larger commitment that needs to be made by the university by the institution that says certain things are fundamental and they're important. Uh, a similar kind of thing has occurred in uh, architectural schools and part of the organization is working with architectural schools and uh, the curriculum is low and everybody has lots of different courses and trying to squeeze one more in sustainable design and trying to shoehorn that into the curriculum, it's always going to be a thrill. And budget cuts uh, occur and the constraint financially, so the first thing is to get cut are things like this. And there's a rethinking of the curriculum, I think it needs to occur virtually everywhere. And reconsidering the way we, we package information and knowledge. So the first things are, are put first. Uh, as to what you specifically uh, say to your uh, department chairman, there are several tools. You can threaten, uh, you can embarrass, you can uh, sweet talk, uh, you can do all kinds of things. But, you're fighting, it sounds to me, a larger institutional issue, perhaps. I don't know if this is what you're missing, but uh, it's an institutional issue of where these things fit. The environment for so long has been marginal. Those of you that teach environmental subjects, you know that you're, you're essentially marginalized. It's kind of a nice thing to do, but it's not fundamental for the purposes. It's not the serious stuff in the institution. And that is a perceptual change that we have to make. So your, your problem is, and I'm sorry I don't have an answer for it. It's a great question, but I don't have an answer for it. Uh, I think the answer is one step above the department level, maybe two steps. That's a good answer. Just talk. Okay. I've got two questions. One is a simple, straightforward one about how did you fund the blue sector? And the other question is when you showed us the great graph with the, uh, the uh, intercline of those who have and those who have not, uh, there in between. How, how would you address that? How, what, what can you do other than? About, about equity? About equity. Uh, well, these two, two uh, questions are interesting to discuss the moment. Uh, the, uh, the rule for the funding Lewis Center was I'm going to raise money for it, and I don't know if any or otherwise like it to get your call. So, call me Lord Cartel. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, I think the rule of thumb is you don't sell buildings, you sell ideas. And if you're doing standard kind of buildings, you've got very few ideas to sell. And I couldn't play the part of institutional loyalty where somebody from class in 1942 bought a name of a building. Uh, so the, the smart, this is the case where the smart building is a building, and the right building is a building, converge on one kind of program. Zero discharge, net energy exporters, and so on. So uh, the rule of thumb was it actually turned out to be uh, the market for raising money in the 90s was a pretty good market, and it turned out to be not terribly difficult to raise money. But I didn't try to sell the building, I tried to sell ideas. And uh, so that was, that was fairly easy. On issues of equity, uh, I don't know. Uh, how, do you, how do you develop uh, equity? And, and it's a more complicated problem than simply equity within people or society at this time. It's equity within all people on the planet, as we now know. And it's uh, equity across generational boundaries, as we now know. Seven generations out of every moment you want to think. But it's also a different kind of equity between 
humans on the planet and all the life forms on the planet. This is a complicated <coughs> conversation. How do you start this? Well, one thing is to start a conversation about it. We don't typically have any courses that deal with things like this uh, in college and university campuses. And they have disappeared. Uh, the conversation about equity, and this, as far as this kind of concern, has disappeared. We have no left. Left. Uh, we have the right wing. And, and the political conversation in this country, unfortunately, I think, is shifted to the right on their terms. I don't know what your politics are. But this is an issue that I think transcends left and right because it's present versus future. 